from anyone before? Thanks everybody for coming out tonight. How's uh, anybody hear me back there? I'm going to group this size and probably should have had some kind of uh, you know, speaker or something. Before I get started in my presentation, I want to introduce you guys to the newest member of our Wealth Guardians family. I want to bring Bryce Payne up here. Bryce has joined us today as an associate advisor. So I'm going to ask Bryce to tell you just a little bit about himself. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Bryce Payne. I look forward to getting to meet you all, know you all over the uh, coming months and years. Uh, Doug just threw this on me about an hour and a half ago that I'm going to be talking to you here, so forgive me if it's a little discombobulated. But this is my first day with Doug. Um, a little bit of my background is uh, I got a degree from the University of Redlands in Communications with a certificate in Education uh, many years ago. Uh, after spending a couple of years in Honduras in the Peace Corps, I uh, got married and uh, started teaching and then decided to uh, start a family. And at a certain point, I uh, figured out I don't want to be around kids all day and then around my own kids in the evening. So I flipped a coin and my kids won. <laughs> so I left teaching and went into ultimately uh, financial advising. I uh, started out with T. Rowe Price out in Colorado, and uh, then moved here to Asheville, actually, and uh, was working with PNC there, and then my wife's job, she's in cardiothoracic medicine, and now works at Quake Baptist. Uh, because she's in cardiothoracic medicine, I follow her where she goes, and just promised this the last time we we're moving anywhere, so we went down here, and I uh, joined up with Doug and his team here. And uh, my daughter, my daughter is now in her freshman year at Queen's University in Charlotte and just finished her first semester with a 4.0, so I'll plug that as well. And uh, let's see, aside, aside from that, in my past times, I like to, my wife and I both like to uh, kayak and mountain bike. I like to take on a sport called uh, disc golf. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of disc golf or not, but there's several courses in town. Uh, I compete locally in that. I don't compete nationally, unfortunately. Would love to, but uh, maybe with Doug's permission, at some point we'll do a, a client appreciation day out on a local course, and I'll uh, show you all how that game is played. Good idea. Yeah. I, I, I love it. So anyway, that's that's me. You might get an email or a phone call from me at some point in the future, and uh, if you have a call, I might give you answers. So again, look forward to uh, meeting you all and getting to know all the names and the faces. Well, so tonight, if you have a chance, to stop by, shake Bryce's hand, and, and introduce yourself. All righty, let's get going here. And you know, unfortunately, uh, we have to do, put up these disclosures for all our legal appeals in, in the audience. Now, you guys got to read every line up here, right? <laughs> While you do that, I'll tell you what it really means. This is what it really means. All your speakers tonight, we think we know what we're talking about. But we can't guarantee it. That's what it means. All right? So, let's go back and let's look at last year. What a year it was, wasn't it? I mean, what a market we had. It was amazing. And the market last year was affected by quite a bit of things. Now, tonight, what we're going to talk about in this market is the factors that affected the market what's on the horizon, and what do these financial experts think the 2018 goals for us? Now, like I said before, last year was amazing. I know this chart's kind of hard to see, but this is last year's stock market. It was just up and up and up and up, even though we had actually read the three Federal Reserve interest rate hikes. And if you look here, from about the end of the summer, to the end of the year, the market really accelerated. And, uh, you know, it was up, S&P was up 19.4%, the Dow was up just over 25%, and the NASDAQ was walking 28%. Now, guys, i got to tell you something. This doesn't happen often. I mean, these kinds of returns, uh, with such little volatility, these are rare, rare years. Uh, so enjoy it. Now, what I think is interesting 
is we've got the Wall Street analysts, there's 10 of them up here, who basically at the beginning of 2017 put out their forecasts. And the closest one was this fellow from Barclays, Jonathan Leone. He was, a, he was guessing an S&P 500 finish of 2400. Well, folks, it actually finished at 26, 7, 2673. If you average up these 10 experts, you know, what they came up with as a, as a core average was 2359. So they completely underestimated the last year's market. Honestly, I was pretty surprised by last year's market. Now, these guys probably knew exactly what was going on. Well, let's kind of examine what happened um, in this market. Let's take a look at the factors that caused the 2017 market to do what it did. We're going to take a look at the, the labor market. We're going to look at housing. We're also going to take a look at consumer spending, corporate growth, and also inflation. Now let's take a look at uh, unemployment for a minute. As you can see, this chart is trending down. And it goes back all the way to the 2008 recession where unemployment was over 10%. I know most of you folks, if you heard me on the radio, you know I don't like the way the government calculates unemployment rates. But you know what? The thing is, this data is the same calculation. What's important to glean from this data is it's all moving in the right direction. We finished 2017 with unemployment at 4.1%, which is the lowest. Listen to this. It's the lowest since 2004. Isn't that amazing? Let's take a look at where all those jobs came from. The biggest jobs, 5 million of them, that came from uh, information services, financial and business services. But we had a healthy growth rate in manufacturing, almost 4 million jobs. And then, of course, we had uh, leisure services and education with about 3 million each. You know what's funny about this chart? Government employment actually shrank. When was the last time that's ever happened? That to me was the amazing stat on that, on that chart. Well, let's take a look at housing. Housing had a really good year last year. If we look at the number of new home sales, that was up almost 27%. And we also had the median prices of new homes climbing 1.2%. And then existing home sales, that was up almost 4%. And their prices were up about 5.6%. Now, this is still not on par with where we were pre-recession. It was a lot better in 05 and 06 than into 07. But this is healthy. This also is moving in the right direction. And you know what they say about housing. Once you get housing going, you're really starting to energize the economy. Because think about it. If you build a house, look at all the people that employs. Look at all the materials that that employs. And when somebody buys a house, guess what you gals do? You redecorate, don't you? So that also employs other people and employs other goods and services. <laughs> Personal income and spending. This was an interesting statistic, too. What the chart is showing you up here is personal income was actually starting to rise, and so was spending. Now, you probably heard this. Consumer spending is two-thirds of our GDP. The black line is spending, and the gold line is income. This, too, is trending in the right direction. That, I'll, I'll bring your attention around to this spike right here. That looks to me like it could be a pre-Christmas spending spike. What I'm concerned about, that is a little concerned, is right here towards the end of the year. Spending went up, but income went down. Now that's a trend I hope to see reverse. And of course, we're still early in the new year. We'll keep our eyes on this and see, see how it goes. All right. Earnings growth, S&P 500 earnings growth. I got to put them on a cheat sheet here because there are lots of numbers. So in the third quarter of last year, 
73 companies on the S&P 500 either beat or exceeded their earnings uh, estimates. 63 percent be on the top line, which is revenue growth. And that's the one I like to watch. You can do a lot of monkey business between revenue and earnings, but revenue tells the tale. If you're growing revenue, that means you're selling goods and services. Now, fourth quarter numbers aren't out yet, but estimates believe uh, that that should be up 10.6 to 11 percent. Again, all moving in the right direction. Inflation numbers. This chart actually goes all the way back to the late 70s, early 80s. Remember that inflationary spike we had back here in the late 70s, early 80s? Well, if we look at this flat line, that's the 50-year average of inflation, which is about 3.4%. We're staying within that trough. So right now, it's started to turn up just a little bit. If you look at the numbers up here, you look at the lines, the yellow line is basically core inflation. And the red line is the actual inflation number. The difference is they take food and energy out of core inflation to smooth it out. And you can see that it, that line is definitely a lot smoother. Again, inflation is still staying within reasonable tolerances, but it is starting to turn up a little bit. All right, so what we've got is consumer sentiment next. Again, that's moving in the, in the right direction because consumer sentiment is a number that we use to kind of help us determine where the economy is headed and also where the S&P 500 may be headed behind that. And again, if you see, oops. If you see, from 2010 on up, from the recession, consumer sentiment got better and better and better. And then finally, in the last couple of years, it really has started to turn up and it really is headed uh, in, in the right direction. So we look back on, on 2017. And uh, you know when we did this thing last year, we looked at a couple of items that were positive. For 2017, U.S. Uh, reached its uh, oil independence. Uh, the economy starting to take off with uh, Trump's election, and then uh, industry starting to come back in, into this country. Then we said, "What happened in 2017 that could reverse that or be negative?" Well, there was some concern that Trump was going to start a trade war. Thankfully, that never happened. There was concern that uh, the European Union would completely dissolve. No, that hasn't happened. And there was also some concern that uh, loose lending standards by the banks uh, was going to trigger inflation. I know everybody's been getting credit card applications in the mail again. Remember right after 2008 that dried up? Well, now that was back. <coughs> What's on the horizon? Well, I brought in two of the best prognosticators I know of to tell us what they think 2018 is going to show us. So I want to introduce to you John Bray and Todd Day from Horizon Financial. Thank you, Doug. Good evening, everyone. So we've covered some of the uh, factors that affected last year. Now we're going to spend some time looking at both the tailwinds and headwinds that will affect the, the speed and the, the moving parts associated with the, the year upon us. 2018 brings many new opportunities. And when we think about the tensions that may ease in North Korea, potentially the European Union uh, strengthening, it may provide international opportunities. And since the tax form, uh, tax reform bill has been passed, the Republicans are promising economic expansion. In this case, we might read future headlines to the effect of <coughs> new tax bill spurs economic growth, tensions with North Korea eases, 
Europe continues to strengthen despite the Brexit. On the other hand, we could have a different picture of what the future might look like. If some of the potential risks and headwinds catch hold, the economy becomes more concerning. In that case, we may have some different headlines. Trump indicted for obstruction of justice. <coughs> America grows, goes to war with North Korea. And similar headline carrying from last year, the European uh, Union is over. Unfortunately, as we all know, no one can predict the future. 2018 brings a noteworthy amount of political uncertainty. We believe like, times like these require the utmost focus on fundamentals and to avoid focusing on emotions. We must look at what's really happening in the economy and the data that's uh, presented to us. Whether real or imagined, Headlines can only be helpful if we stop and focus on the truths that are provided rather than all the hype. As stated, the most important information to focus on is both the economy and the markets. And for more detail on that, I'm going to turn it over to Todd Day. Good evening, everyone. Hope you're doing well. <clears throat> well, certainly the markets these days with the internet and the proliferation of uh, access to information. Uh, markets can be uh, really headline driven, whether it's uh, a belief that, you know, wages are growing a little faster than happened a couple of weeks ago that drove the markets into a craziness. Uh, but they can really be uh, impactful on the markets. But it's important to look at those underlying fundamentals for the economy and for the markets to see what things really look like. So, let's take a refresh course. This is a <clears throat> chart of 20 different barometers on the economy and on the markets. And this takes us back to the middle of the great financial crisis in 2008. And the first thing that sticks out in your mind that you see, there's a lot of red. The economy was in trouble, corporate earnings were down, <coughs> uh, leading indicators were falling. Things weren't good. But now let's fast forward to January of last year. Well, obviously you're going to see a lot more green on Map. You see the economic outlook is strong, consumer sentiment high, corporate profits are growing. So these indicators which look out three to six months on the economy and the markets, at the beginning of last year, they were looking pretty good. Now if we come forward to December of this year, of this past year, <clears throat> well, there we go. You still see a lot of green on the map. With the one exception of the red down here in the corner, that's geopolitical risk, and that's pretty much uh, thanks to our great relationship with North Korea. Now, there are a couple of yellow warning signs, if you will, one of which are equity market valuations. Are stocks overvalued? Well, let's take a look at that. <clears throat> Going back over the last 25 years, the, the way we measure the valuation of the stock is we take its price and we divide it by its earnings and we get a PE ratio, a price to earnings ratio. So over the last 25 years, the S&P 500 has traded an average of about 16 times forward earnings. Okay? So you can see at the end of the chart over here, in December, we were a little bit overvalued. We were trading at about 18.2 times forward earnings. Now, the last couple of weeks has taken care of a lot of that. We've fallen to just 16.3 as of last week. So, if you look at it just on the surface, we're really trading, you know, about the average as far as whether they're undervalued or overvalued. They're just, they're valued. <clears throat> but what about in relation to inflation and where we are right now? Because we all know we're in a historically low, uh, you know, inflation environment. <clears throat> if you look back to 1871, when inflation was running 1 to 2 percent, then the uh, average P-E ratio for the S&P 500 was around 20. Even in December, and then January was a great month, even in December and January's P-E ratios that were 18, 18 and a half, 
and now have fallen back to 16.3. For this inflation environment, I don't think that we're that far overvalued. <clears throat> now that's for the U.S. markets. And we haven't really mentioned anything about the international markets. <clears throat> so I kind of wanted to make a case for you know, having some international exposure. This chart compares in the gray the S&P 500. And the purple line is the Morgan Stanley Capital Index. It's the all-country world index with no U.S. exposure. So let's just call that the international market. You can see that just at first glance that they pretty move lockstep with one another up and down. However, since the great financial crisis in 2008, early 2009, you can see the disparity in growth for the S&P has grown almost 300%. Whereas the ex-U.S. or the international market is only up about 127 percent. Once again, you can see where we can't see that uh, in that corner. But what I point out here is we were trading 18.2 times our other earnings. The average was 16, but the international was trading at 14.3, where their average is 14.5. So there's one point for the international exposure that they may be a little less. Uh, value than the U.S. markets. <laughs> Another way to look at it is the earnings per share growth. Now the first thing you look at this and see with Europe on the bottom in the light blue, well that would be your first, first, first your, your choice, but you could only be partly correct. So if you look at the chart on the right, you can see the U.S. is overvalued at the end of the year. You can see the developed markets, which is the second column. There are three uh, value. The uh, Europe is right on par with its average, but Japan, look at Japan how far below this average. So there may be some opportunities for investment. <clears throat> and the emerging markets were trading right on their average. But now as far as Europe is concerned and exposure to Europe, you can clearly see the chart on the left, the, the gray line, that's GDP growth. And it's obviously accelerating. The blue bars going up and down, that's domestic demand. People are spending money, they're buying stuff. That's obviously increasing. And then the, the purple is their exports. And that's started turning positive over the last uh, several quarters. Now, couple that with uh, unemployment that's running at multi year lows. And loan demand, people are demanding to borrow money that may present a good opportunity for investment within the European markets or the developed markets. <clears throat> but it's not just about the big uh, countries that are developed, you know, within Europe. There may be opportunities within the emerging markets, the smaller growing countries. Obviously, a company, if you just think of a company, a uh, small company uh, that starts out in retail, it'll add a store, and then at another store, well, they can grow a lot faster than a Walmart because Walmart's so big, it takes longer to turn a big ship around like that. But the emerging markets, they're smaller and more nimble. And so they can, any bit of growth they add is going to be exponentially a little bit more than the larger markets. Here, we, get, we can tell the uh, purple line is the emerging markets. Their GDP growth is a little higher. The gray line is the developed markets outside of the U.S. They're obviously growing, but they're growing at a slower pace. The main point to make here is in the gray shaded area is the acceleration in growth. And that's what we like to see, not only in the developed markets, but also for the emerging markets. <clears throat> Once again, over here, when you say emerging markets, the light blue line, that's Asia and Pacific Rim. The dark line here, that's Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. But then when you get to the bottom here, that's Latin America. And obviously you can see that the, the trajectory that Asia and uh, Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, they're on a solid trajectory upwards. But you can't just go out there and blanket by everybody. Because you can tell by the Latin American countries, think Mexico. Venezuela, Brazil, they have more political turmoil than we do. And so their earnings growth 
is more flat line. So you do have to be a little bit slow. <coughs> so I think what we've been able to show you is that when you look at the different barometers on the economy and on the stock market, they're all pretty much in the green with the exception of the geopolitical risk. And that's just not something we can control over the day. Now, the equity market valuations, they've come down and they're really running at the average that we've seen over the last 20, 25 years. <coughs> not only that, we've seen where the developed and the emerging markets outside of the U.S. can offer some opportunities, if you will, for some exposure in your, your stock portfolio. <coughs> now that we've looked at that, I'm going to let John go back and take a look at the chart that shows what the, some of the brightest minds on Wall Street are thinking for the S&P this year. Okay, so Doug's covered a lot of uh, factors for this past year. Uh, Todd's reference that, spoke to the larger picture throughout the world. Now we're going to go back to some of the, uh, the details that Doug referenced earlier. <coughs> what you're probably most interested in, what's, what's happened has happened, and where are we now moving forward. This is not necessarily the same 10 uh, institutions, the same 10 analysts, but it is uh, some, some current details of the, the top analysts on Wall Street. And what you'll see is there's a range in the index, the target, uh, the, the target pricing between 2350 and 3100. So 2350 would reflect about a 1.3% loss between the beginning of this year and the end of the year. And 3100 would reflect a little bit over a 14% gain by the end of the year. So as always, there's a wide range, but what is holding consistent is that in this case, all of these analysts, except for the one at the top, all of these analysts are predicting growth. What does that say? that there's, Wall Street is still optimistic, they're still positive about the markets, despite what's happened uh, in early February. Relatively speaking, the market closed today, basically a few points on the S&P 500 um, above the reference that Doug gave, so we're just about uh, where we were at the end of December, beginning of January, despite a, a fairly volatile rise. So all things being said, Wall Street is feeling very positive and optimistic, even though the average of 7.1, all these numbers added up, 17.1 is slightly less than half of what happens. Doug referenced the 19.4% performance by the S&P last year. We're certainly looking for some positive things to take place. So I'm going to turn it over to Doug for some action items and we'll keep going. So, you know, I consider, I consider all of us a team. As we go through 2018, I'm going to ask you guys to do something for this team. What I want you to do is keep us informed of what is going on in your life. And But in actuality, 
the average work week fell. So when you average that out, the average paycheck actually went down a little bit. And um, what that did was during the sell-off on that Friday was it it got um, it got magnified in the ETFs and the ETNs that are uh, highly leveraged, double and triple leveraged. They're inverse related to the markets, and uh, people got caught. You know, you saw who was swimming without bathing suit on at that point, basically, and uh, that kept going into Monday and Tuesday, and until they could unwind a lot of those volatility <coughs> trades and those program trades. Um, but then the whole uncertainty came back about inflation with the CPI the last week. It came in a little hotter than expected, but the markets pretty much took it in stride. And the reason that the markets uh, look at that inflation number so closely is because if inflation is rising faster than expected, then the Fed, the Federal Reserve, is going to be behind the curve with, the, with regards to raising interest rates. Here everybody's thinking, well, in 2018, they may raise them three times. But when they saw those inflationary figures, they are like, oh, no, it's going to be four. And so that's what kind of freaked out the markets. And we saw bond yields run up um, and across the board. The two, the five, the seven, the tens, the thirties, they all started climbing. And uh, it's not necessarily the notion of higher rates that scare the market, but it's the accelerate, the, the, the rate of vol the, the rate of velocity at which it went up in such a quick time. That's what really freaked the markets out. So that's what got the whole ball of wax rolling. And honestly, everybody was looking for a reason to sell. We had an incredible year last year with record high to record high. And in January, we were back in that same boat, record high to record high. And a lot of traders and investors were sitting there and just looking for any reason to hit that sell up. So that's what really got things going up in this year. You're seeing about international investing. Is this going to be a net minus or a net plus to the economy? 
we're going to see additional debt, drive interest rates, then we get into a kind of fund debt, but there's also the growth from the construction and that kind of thing. Net net, what's your best perspective if that goes through how it's going to watch? Well, from one perspective, it's hard to know when we would reach a point of too much debt, right? You know, when is too much? We've already, you know, if not, if not in the past, now, when would be too much? Todd can speak to a little bit more of maybe the, the infrastructure element and, and your question specifically. My answer would probably be yes. It all depends. Because we're in uncharted waters with, you know, this type of infrastructure package that they're trying to uh, get through with the, the debt level that we are at now, the rising interest rates, and being able to service the existing debt. But with the economic growth that that infrastructure could bring, um, we're in an uncharted territory. So we're going to have to really, you know, fill our way through that. In conjunction with tax reform. Yeah, that's really yeah, tax reform. There's, there's so many balls in the air. There's a number of moving parts, and Amy's going to speak to tomorrow uh, of that, how that may play out. And she'll cover all your questions, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> On taxes. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Okay, I'll tell you, we're going to bring up our next speaker, uh, Ben Blindhouse. Sherry, we're going to introduce him. Well, I get his help. I would say, y'all are way smarter than me because. Half the stuff that y'all talk about up here is like a way of mind. We always know the folks that come to our state of the market event are the ones that are really interested in the nuts and bolts of this, and uh, that's part of why we do it. So, uh, so we mentioned a little bit earlier that uh, Ben Limehouse is a local attorney here in Winston Salem. His uh, practice is over off of Knollwood. And uh, he and Doug got to know each other this past year through a mutual client that both Doug and Ben were serving. Unfortunately, both she and her spouse encountered some pretty um, tremendous health care issues that required some very specific financial planning. And that's how we uh, met Ben. Doug was really impressed with Ben's knowledge and his compassion in dealing with that situation. And so Doug and Ben had lunch together, and Doug felt really comfortable that Ben and his firm had a lot of the same values about serving clients as we did. And so we asked Ben if he would be willing to um, make a presentation here. His firm specializes in estate planning, in elder law care, elder care law, I'm not sure if I said that right. And elder law is fine. In a special needs trusts and guardianship situations. So a lot of you probably have an attorney, and that's great. But that's a question that Doug gets often from our clients is, do you have someone that you would recommend if a situation comes up that we speak to, um, which is part of why we want to introduce Ben to you. Um, and so he's got a, a presentation that he'd like to make. And I just want to let you know that um, before you leave this evening, if you have any interest in picking up one of his business cards, we do have those uh, in fact. So help me welcome Ben Warren. I wish I had you to do all my introductions. <laughs> estate planning, I think the, the first things that come into your mind are, uh, how am I going to distribute assets in my death? What means am I going to use, you know, wills, trusts, that sort of thing, to distribute assets in my death? And I think there's a more fundamental question uh, that is, if anything, even more important than having a will in place, is to consider what would happen, 
during your lifetime if you were unable to make decisions for yourself. The very first thing that I do when I have a new client in the office is I look and see, I want to know if they've got power of attorney in place. A well-written, durable power of attorney that would allow someone to step in their shoes to make decisions for them if they were unable to do so themselves. Now, if you ever get to the point in your life when you're unable to manage your own affairs, you got two options. Either you've done something and planned ahead, or you've done nothing at all, and guardianship becomes a reality. Has anyone had any experience with dealing with guardianships, for either for a child, or a parent, or, uh, those of you that have, even just a, a Maybe you weren't acting as a guardian, but maybe you had a parent uh, that was in a guardianship situation. You know how incredibly difficult that can be. When a person is incompetent in North Carolina, what that means is that the law or the uh, courts have determined that that person is no longer possessing the capacity to make decisions about finances, to make decisions about health care, and to make other family decisions. It could be caused by um, dementia, which is, is something that I deal with a lot uh, in my office. It could be caused by um, developmental disabilities, you know, from a child who's born with a developmental disability. It could be caused by a person suffering a traumatic brain injury through some form of an accident, car accident, or the like. Now, in North Carolina, this differs slightly from state to state, but in North Carolina, it's the clerk of court that determines that a person is incapacitated and unable to make decisions. And the way that works is that an interested party, most often uh, with an older adult, it's a child that's, that's filing the petition. A petition gets filed in the courts with the clerk of court. Um, there's service of process, the petition has to be served by a sheriff on the individual who's alleged to be incompetent. Uh, and then there'll be a hearing. Usually evaluations will be ordered, and a, a, a psychiatrist or a, a, a doctor that specializes in older adults will do an evaluation. And if the court decides that this person is incompetent at that point, a guardian is appointed. Two kinds of guardians, guardian of the estate, which deals with money, and guardian of the person, which makes uh, personal and health care decisions. And then there's also, those roles can be combined in a single uh, job called the general guardian, which handles both. Now, if you dealt with guardianship, you know what the difficulties are. You have to, at least once per year, provide an accounting of all the assets, all of the exchanges of money, any bills that have been paid, it has to be very, very thorough. Uh, so you've got the court looking over your shoulder. The uh, court can demand that more frequently than anything. Sometimes you have to get court, court permission in order to uh, perform certain transactions, such as, as uh, gifting property from one spouse to the other. So if you needed to retitle a house, for example, in one spouse's name, you have to have permission to do that. Uh, all the decisions are going to be subject to court scrutiny. And the incompetent person, the person who's been determined to be incompetent, may have not wanted the person that was appointed the guardian to be making decisions for him or her. <coughs> Finally, expense. You're going to have to pay perhaps an attorney or some other person to actually file the petitions in court. You're going to have to pay court costs. You're going to have to pay a CPA to do the accounting. It's just a lot of expense. How do you get around this? With a durable power of attorney for finances. The very, very, very first thing you should be thinking about if you are planning your estate before anything else. There's also a health care power of attorney and living will and, and the additional tools that are sometimes used in hospital settings. Now, the power of attorney, the POA, a lot of people 
I've had clients that come in and say, well, I don't want to, you know, I, I realize that I might need some help paying bills, but I don't want to turn over everything to my, uh, my daughter or my son. I'm still able to do things for myself. It's a common misconception that people hold that by doing a power of attorney, by signing on that, that line, you're handing over everything. You're handing over your power to do things for yourself. And you're not. Not the case. Uh, I like to use the illustration of giving uh, a key to your car to your neighbor for safekeeping in case you get locked out. When you do that, that doesn't mean you can't drive your car anymore. It just means that you've got an extra person that can get you in, that can do the things that you need to do if you ever get to the point of needing that. The agent, the person that you appoint, steps into the shoes of the principal to do anything that you can do for yourself. So writing checks, uh, selling property, handling retirement benefits, any of the things that you could normally do for yourself. It could also include the power to make gifts of property, which can be very important in an elder law setting. I'll give you uh, an example. If you've ever, if you, anybody from Stokes County? Anybody here? I've worked a lot with folks in Stokes County, and anytime I'm dealing with people with property in Stokes County, it seems like everybody in Stokes County, in addition to their house, has at least four or five different parcels all over, all over creation. Uh, 20 acres here, 20 acres there. It's, you know, it's a very rural county. Same in Yadkin County. Yadkin County might be even more prevalent. Uh, if you ever get to the point where you're applying for Medicaid, and we have to do that a lot in our office just because uh, paying for long-term care in a nursing home is so ridiculously expensive. In a neighborhood of $8,000 a month, um, people can go through their assets just like that. You ever play, pay, uh, apply for Medicaid, you have to get your assets spent down to a certain level. $2,000 of count, what they call countable assets. All of those parcels, those additional parcels of land that folks in Stokes County and, and Yadkin County and other places have are countable assets. So you might end up with folks that are uh, cash poor but land rich. In cases where we have an adult who's applying for Medicaid and that adult is no longer able to make decisions for themselves, we need to get that property out of their name in order to get them qualified for Medicaid. Without a power of attorney, with a gifting power, or without a guardianship, which we don't want because of the difficulties in having one, you can't do that. You're stuck. You're stuck selling property and spending money now. And a lot of times that's just not what folks want to do. I don't have a problem. Durable means that the power of attorney remains in effect once the person is actually no longer possessing capacity. And it's important that the power of attorney be durable. And we'll just talk about the gift of power. Um, what questions do you have so far about this? Anything at all? If you do own, say, a large amount of property um, and you want to give it to someone to get it out of mom's name so mm -hmm. that we can take care of them, is there a time limit from when I gift it, say, to... Very good question. So her question, if you can hear in the back, her question is if, if you've got several parcels of land and you want to get that out of mom or dad's name, is there a time limit on which you can do that? And I think you, by time limit, you're asking about what would the uh, drawback be for applying for Medicaid? Yes. Exactly. Um, the, the answer to that is that Medicaid is going to look back for a period of five years upon the date that you apply for Medicaid. And it will, it will look and see if you've made any gifts to children, to, to gifts between spouses are always okay. But gifts to other people, you get a sanction for that. Okay, so there's a five-year look-back period. So if, if people are wanting to give property to the children, I always say it's better to do it earlier than later. Because um, there's always the risk. You know, you don't know what's, we don't have a crystal ball, unfortunately. We don't know what's going to happen. So there's always a risk 
that if you wait too long and try to gift that property at a later time, you're going to run up against that five-year look-back period and end up getting sanctioned. It's a dollar-for-dollar dollar sanction. Now, there are, there are certain kinds of deeds. There are workarounds to that. They're not full -proof. If you've got, say, like a child and their family is living with the parent that has Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and she has to go into the nursing home or anything, and they've been living with them, say, for four or five years, mm -hmm. will they make them? Yeah, now there's, there's a good, that's a, another good question. Following up on that question, mm -hmm. she was asking if there's a, a caretaker child living in the home, can you make a gift to that child without getting sanctioned? The answer is yes. As one of the exceptions that the Medicaid manual um, offers folks to use, you have to be uh, you have to show that the caretaker child's been living in the home for at least two years, and you've also got to be able to show. You can usually get a doctor to um, to write a note to this effect. You've also got to be able to show that the care that's been provided to that adult kept that adult out of nursing home care for, for that period. So if you can meet those two criteria, you can make that gift to the caretaker child uh, without penalty. Another, uh, another exception in addition to that one is a child that's, that's disabled. Yes, sir? You went over what uh, triggers a guardianship, the petition. Mm -hmm. What triggers a durable power of, of, of attorney? What, what allows that person to begin uh, managing your affairs? Good question. So what allows a durable power, to a person appointed, an agent appointed under a durable power of attorney to start managing? And the answer is that as soon as you sign, that person has the authority from that point on. Now, there are certain kinds of powers of attorney called springing powers of attorney that have some sort of trigger. Uh, usually when the doctor has determined that the person is incapacitated. Sometimes, I, I, I've, I've done those a few times, I generally don't recommend it because I get nervous about having uh, a period of time in which action needs to be taken, uh, but we're waiting on someone to make the determination that mom or dad is no longer capable of, of doing it. Themselves. So the agent best basically decides when they try to start uh, managing the affairs? Well, decision? it's, I mean, it's, 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 you, you have power concurrently. And so, that's a dangerous thing because what you're doing, by doing this, is you're actually giving this agent a license to steal. So, it demands that you be very, very careful about the people that you're appointing uh, when you make that decision. So, you're the wrong person? Yes. Uh, they are bound, he's asking if there's a remedy, that if they are bound to act only in the person in the principal's best interest, and they can be found, uh, you can pursue legal action against them. Um, and revocation is, is a fairly simple process. You had a two-part question. One, you're talking about power of attorney. Um, and, and is that in general both health care and power attorney? For I, yeah, I haven't really touched on health care yet, and I know we're, we're kind of running out of time too, but let me, I was going to touch on that next. Okay, so that's separate. Yeah. And secondly, if, uh, say you have a parent who's put you on all of their financial accounts, their banking, their retirement, maybe part of it, they, 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 they change the deed on their house, you're on their deed, if they've got all their financial bases covered, is there still a need for a power of attorney? Yes, because the power of attorney is broader than that. Um, the power of attorney would allow, and, and here's something that I've used, gosh, it's February, into February, I've used this provision twice this year already. A uh, power of attorney would allow uh, an agent to create a revocable trust to manage mom and dad's assets if they ever got to a point where they couldn't do it for themselves. And, We've used that in, in cases where, um, thinking of one particular case in which a client had an advanced form of dementia and she was just kind of going crazy with her money. She was, people would call her on the phone um, and demanding, you know, payment for this, that, and the other. Um, she was just, you know, spending, spending her money left and right and, and was unable to, to manage that anymore. So it was dangerous for her to still be having 
to still have access to all of that. Um, and what we did was we used the power of attorney to create a revocable trust, which is just a toolbox, moved all the assets into that, and then let the, uh, I think it was an adult son, actually manage everything at that point. And um, you don't have the power to change the, the provisions of, of distribution, so you couldn't, you couldn't have one, you couldn't have one child uh, putting everything in a revocable trust and providing that at death, everything got distributed to that one child. You couldn't change the terms of the, of the, of the will or the, yeah. And, and then uh, power of attorney uh, is required for a retirement account, right? You can't add a child or someone else under a retirement account. It only has supportive access through a power of attorney document. That's been my understanding. I didn't know if that was an official thing or, or yeah. So because of a 401k plan, So the only way to have authority over that account is through a properly written uh, power of attorney document that allows for those authorities, allows for those powers. But that's not the beneficiary. That's putting them on the account, right? We'll say that again. You can still you can still designate beneficiary. Oh yeah, absolutely. Children. That doesn't. Right, right, right. So you're, you're, you're not changing beneficiaries simply by doing a power of attorney. It could be the same person, it could be different people. Um, let me just say a couple of things about, uh, I'm, I'm going to kind of cut the PowerPoint presentation short because I know we'll run a little bit short of time. But this, so far I've just been talking about the financial and durable power of attorney. It's equally important to do a healthcare power of attorney as well. In a healthcare power of attorney, you are naming the people that you want to make decisions for you. Um, I'll be honest with you, no one I'm a uh, blood relative of is named in my health care power of attorney. Uh, not because I don't love them, not because I don't trust them, but because I think the decision making would be extraordinarily difficult. So I've got uh, a number of friends that are named in mine. It's important too when you do a power of attorney or when you do a living will, which is you stating that you don't want to be your life uh, extended by being hooked up to all those machines. When you do that, I can't tell you the number of times I see people, they sign these documents and then they go into a drawer and they don't discuss anything with the kids or with the people that they've named. Uh, so important to have that discussion. It's not pleasant. It's not the most enjoyable thing in the world, but having that discussion, if ever a difficult decision has to be made. I say this from personal experience too. If a decision, a difficult decision has to be made, it's so much easier to make that decision when mom has actually said, look, this is what I want when the time comes. And I'll end on that note. Any, any further questions about uh, this or anything else? Though? As I mentioned, we certainly have Ben's cards uh, in the back again. You're welcome to take a few of uh, with you. And then obviously there's his contact. Uh, info here. I'm going to stick around to the end. If you've got other questions you want to talk to me about, we'll be happy to stuff. Some of you may know this, um, but a little over a year ago, I myself was in this very situation. My father is remarried. My mother passed away about 20 years ago. So we have a situation where we had her children and my father's children and both of them were experiencing some pretty significant health issues. Um, my father did make me the durable power of attorney and about two weeks after he did that, he actually passed out at his home and almost died. He was in a hospital for about three weeks. So your analogy about the putting the spare key was excellent because for about two and a half months, I was paying my father's bills and I was managing all of his finances because beforehand he had established that relationship. Um, as there is in almost every family, there was some dysfunction in our family and our extended family and I feel fairly certain that if my dad had not taken that step, 
that we would have had a lot of other issues to deal with besides just uh, getting him well. Fortunately, uh, with great medical care and the grace of God, he uh, made a pretty significant <coughs> recovery. He's living at home and he does have some assistance. His wife has since passed away. But he is now paying all his own bills and taking care of his finances again. I just really feel like um, it is one of the best gifts you can give yourself, but I would say because a lot of you were all in the same age group, it's one of the best gifts you can give your children or your family to get these things, these tools in place because you honestly never know what's going to happen. So uh, hopefully all of you have those uh, situations wrapped up, but if not, then uh, obviously you've got a resource that could help you if you're interested in that. So thank you, Ben, we really appreciate that a lot. Um, last but definitely not least, uh, we had mentioned that Amy Gardner, a CPA, who's right down here on Stadium Drive, um, with uh, Lindsay and Gardner is going to speak for a few minutes about the 2018 tax reform uh, and hopefully some positive things about uh, what we might be able to expect. Um, I myself keep hearing about how it was a really great tax reform and we should all benefit, but I'm uh, honest to admit that I'm not sure that I, I understand uh, some of the ways that that will happen. Um, so she's going to share a little insight, she'll take some questions, and just in case I don't get back up in front of you, I wanted to let you know that we also have uh, Amy's cards in the back. If any of you are looking for CPAs, that's probably one of the biggest questions that Doug gets from various clients is, do you have someone uh, that you would recommend that we speak to or talk to? Um, and so, without further ado, I'm going to bring uh, yeah. up. So, thank you. Thank you. Taxes. What, what, what can I say other than they're here? <laughs> and the tax cuts and the Jobs Act of 2017 is the biggest tax adjusting act that's happened since 1986. So, that can tell you how voluminous this tax act is. Not only did it affect individuals, but it's affected um, the states, and it has affected trusts, and it has affected uh, businesses as well. Uh, I'm just going to use some of my cheat, sheet, my cheat sheet here to give you some of the highlights of what's happened that may affect you guys here in the room. But on December the, uh, 22nd of 2017, the President signed into legislation the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017, and that's the official name of the Tax Act. Um, it's effective, most of it is effective for the year 2018 starting, and it will sunset, meaning it will expire on 2025. So we have several years that we're going to be under this tax reform. Uh, as of today, the IRS still does not have written legislation. We have committee reports that we are banking on, and we feel pretty comfortable that what we have is the way it's going to be. But until the IRS writes their uh, regulations, we, we uh, would have to double check everything back to the legislation and then to the, from the committee reports to the legislation that the IRS writes. But um, the tax rates, those of you that are still gainfully employed, Hopefully, in your paycheck you received in February, you got a little bit more money this, this time because the tax rates did drop. We still have seven tax brackets, uh, but the, the tax, uh, highest tax bracket used to be 39.6% for federal, and it dropped down to 37%. And the ranges did change. So those of you that were in the, uh, say the 25% tax bracket, your income uh, zeroed out at up to 28%. Once you reached 153,000, 
Now it is 165,000. So the ranges have gotten a little bit wider, and the tax rates have dropped. Uh, so that uh, that's a good thing. Um, uh, another thing that's happened just recently um, is uh, the kitty tax. And some of you that may have children or grandchildren that have unearned income, uh, unearned income is no longer taxed at the parent's rate. And that's a big thing that a lot of people were not sure, not, didn't understand is that uh, when you have a child and you have money in their account or a grandchild and you have money in their account that's taxable, uh, they had to be taxed at the parents' rate. That's no longer uh, uh, possible in the year 2018 going forward, but they are being taxed at the trust and the estate tax rates, which are higher. So that's a the negative. Um, so that's a, that's a big change that was made. The capital gains rates are still in effect, and that's wonderful. Um, they range from zero to 20%. Um, capital, and it's a graduated table, so some people that have just dividends, they may have $77,000 worth of income and have no tax, but uh, it graduates up to anything over $479,000 would then be taxed at 20%. So that's a good thing that they left that intact because we were concerned about that one going away. The standard deduction doubled. Um, it, for a married Collin joint uh, couple, it's twenty-four thousand dollars now. For a single couple, single individual, it's twelve thousand. And this is for the years two thousand eighteen through two thousand twenty-five. Um, that's a great thing. But on the flip side of that, no longer are you allowed to have personal exemptions. So those of you that are used to claiming yourselves and maybe some children. Um, no longer do you get those exemptions. So even though the standard deduction went higher, the personal exemptions went away. And that's, that's a big hit uh, that a lot of people weren't aware that happened to them. Uh, the child tax credit did increase to $2,000 per qualifying child under the age of 17. Um, and there's also uh, $1,400 of child credit that's refundable for anyone who has a child under the age of 17. Um, and this is again starting in the year 2018. <coughs> a, a nice plan that they have out now is the 529 plans. Uh, most of you are familiar with the 529 plan where you put money into your child or your grandchild's uh, education uh, account. It used to be that you could not use the 529 planning unless it was for a college. And they changed that now, that the 529 plan can be used for elementary and secondary public schools, private schools, or religious school tuition. You can use up to $10,000 a year. And uh, so if you have, to have a child that uh, is in private school and they're uh, uh, in uh, primary school or secondary school, you can use $10,000 a year for that. Student loans, this is a big issue. Uh, student loan debt is, is uh, out of control, as we all know. But student loans uh, discharged in, in an account where someone dies or they're permanently disabled, they're excluded from income. But uh, that's the only time that um, student loan interest can be forgiven. Itemized deductions took a big hit this year. Even though the standard deduction increased, um, in the past we have been able to deduct the amount of money we pay the state as a tax item on itemized deductions. That went away. So any money that you've been used to taking as a deduction on Schedule A for taxes paid went away, and that's a big hit on a lot of people's itemized deduction schedule, and it may keep people from being able to itemize going forward. Home mortgage interest is only deductible on debt up to $750,000. Used to be a million dollars of indebtedness for home, uh, home or second home, but that is now $750,000.
Uh, real estate taxes, state and local personal property taxes are still deductible, but it's limited to $10,000 now. And casualty losses, there's no deduction anymore for personal casualty losses. And that starts in the year 2018. The only time a casualty loss is deductible is if it is, if it is a federally declared disaster. <coughs> Charitable contributions are still deductible. Um, a lot of charities are, are concerned about um, being able to get as much funding as they have in the past since a lot of people will no longer be itemizing. But charitable uh, contributions are still allowed uh, as a deduction, assuming you itemize. If you do not itemize, the charitable contributions are not deductible on your return. You still can use your uh, IRA, uh, your, your qualified retirement fund, excuse me, uh, to uh, send money to the charity if you uh, so are inclined to do charitable contributions. So check with your investment advisor about that. Alimony. Uh, in 2017, alimony payments were received, were included in income. Alimony payments paid were deductible by the person paying them. That has changed. In 2018, is an effective date for a divorce decree or a separation agreement executed after December 31st, 2018. Alimony is no longer going to be taxable, but that it's meant the payer is no longer going to be able to take a deduction. So um, that's, a, that's a huge change. Moving expenses are no longer deductible. Um, only unless it is, you're in the military. If you're in the military, they are deductible. Miscellaneous itemized deductions such as tax prep fee, investment fees for uh, your money management, uh, union dues, um, safe deposit box. I'm just going through the list of some of the things that have been deductible in the past and are no longer deductible when you itemize uh, your taxes. Uh, they also repealed the ACA, a lot of people call it Obamacare, but they also repealed the individual mandate. Now in 2017, as I'm doing a tax return for someone in 17, if they don't have health insurance coverage, there's a penalty and they have to pay a fine. That's gone away as of 2018. Gifts and estates, um, there, there's been the double the unified credit um, for estate purposes. Um, it's $11,200,000 now in 2018. Um, effective for individuals dying or gifts made after December 2017 and for January 2026. So that um, date is important to remember. Uh, for those of you that may want to do some gifting uh, unified credit in, in the near future. You also still, at the date of death, uh, get a step up of basis of inherited assets. That was retained. There was a chance that they were going to repeal that, that assets you inherited would not get a step up of basis, but that um, was retained, and that's a good thing. Um, so if, if most of you, a lot of you maybe know already, they, that they have you Inherit property and at that base of death, fair it gets a new basis. Not and that basis is the fair market value, value. Not, that, not that the uh, person who gave is not their, their basis. It's not their basis. It's not their basis. What they pay for it is the inherited basis. Some of you may get hit every year with the alternative minimum tax. Some of you may get hit every year with alternative minimum tax. Uh, alternative no minimum tax for corporations uh, was repealed. There's no longer any more uh, alternative minimum tax, 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 tax for corporations, but it was okay. not repealed for individuals. So it's modified a tax, but it's not repealed. Tax in the past, so if you've been subject to alternative minimum tax in the past, you're probably going to be subject to 
alternative minimum tax. Want to talk just a little bit about businesses. Some of you may own this own businesses. Want to talk just a little bit about businesses. Some of you may own this own businesses. Uh, really yeah. the, um, did well corporations more uh, really the tax um, rate did well with this tax reform the tax rate flat the rate tax is rate now 24 percent income tax and flat rate so it is now 21 percent of taxable income so regardless of what the income is if you're a C corporation your tax rate is 21 percent and we've had tons of questions from people who are S corporation owners that will the culture of say should I go and change to the structure of my business from an S corporation to a C corporation. I'm in the 37% tax bracket at the same amount of income should I blow through my tax and I have the same amount of income and all sounds good be taxed at 21%. Well, it all sounds good, but the only way to get money out of a C corporation is the only way to get money out of a C corporation is through salaries, which are quoted in, and you pay it your dividend tax rate, or dividends, and dividends are not deductible by the corporation in most cases, but they are taxable to the individual at individual tax rates. So we have to remind you that if you have a C corporation, so that you may very well get double taxation. So be very careful before you just do a knee jerk reaction and automatically revoke your S corporation election. Um, you need to prepare uh, income tax projections and tax prepare the see what the difference in tax burger you be. And if you have an S corporation and you're used to taking the money out of the corporation every year, and then chances are you want to remain an S corporation. But it's an individual basis. There's another tax credit that businesses receive. And some There's another of you tax credit that businesses uh, receive, and some of you may have heard this because it was a big seller when they were trying to get this, uh, tax, reform, uh, uh, get this uh, uh, tax reform. And you're uh, a if you own a business, or you, and you're an S corporate pass through entity, you may or get even a self-employed individual, you may get a deduction of 20% of your income. And that's, that's a deduction that's a against deduction. other income. It is subject, however, and that's, to, that's a huge deduction. Of w it is subject, wages however, to 50% um, of W-2 wages or 25% of, of a calculated determined Calculation goes on forever. But it should be around 20% of your net income wage. If you're a well, that's a big deduction, that W-2 wages. Uh, a lot of people will but that's a big deduction year. that uh, a lot of people will benefit from One thing from I want to mention year. about reasonable compensation if you own a business. One thing I want to mention about uh, reasonable IRS compensation really if you own a business. Um, the IRS is really cracking down on businesses that are not paying reasonable compensation. I think it's very small salary. Easy to get into the trap and take yourself a small salary from your business and take it more distribution out of your business. And the reason people do that is distributions from your company are not taxable to Social Security and Medicare. And Social Security and Medicare is taxed at 15.3% federal. And that's a lot. So if you were self-employed, plus your federal, or plus your state, so if you were self-employed or have a low entity that's tax for self-employment purposes, you may very well find yourself up to be 42 percent tax bracket. So a lot of people do not pay themselves high salaries to keep that tax down. The IRS is now saying that reasonable compensation must be paid. And if they come in and they audit your business, they very well may yourself reasonable compensation. They very well may deem all distributions to be time devil as W-2 wages. And that could be pretty devastating. Appreciation was another uh, deduction that uh, businesses. Appreciation was another uh, deduction um, that uh, businesses received this year. Now, um, is Section 179 appreciation now is, is uh, about $2.5 million in asset purchase. So a business that purchases assets, we take a Section 179 piece of the bracket, write off the appreciation dollars. 
So if I got a piece of spins and all of that fifty one thousand dollars, that's a and I can expense all of that in one year. And that's a big tax savings for a lot of businesses to get that rather right off appreciation. They also will allow and use equipment to qualify for that now. In the past that was not allowed. So that's a big net operating loss. Business. If you have a business and you have a net operating loss, net operating loss. loss. If you have a business and you have a net operating loss, you can no longer carry that loss and back. It used to be that you could be carrying it back for two and years and three and have some taxes that you were paid. And it's no longer allowed. You have to carry it forward. It be. And carry forwards are unlimited now. And, and what kind of exchange is that? I'm going to something about that because some of you And what kind of exchange is I'm going to something about that because some of you may flip property where you have a uh, kind of exchange and you keep the growing the game. Uh, white kind of changes did change a bit real this year that it almost qualifies for real property, real, property, real, property, real estate, real estate investment property. You can't qualify for other tangible assets. Sexual harassment is big in the news, of course, and um, sexual harassment is big in the news, of course, and, there's and no deduction um, for sexual if there's a sexual harassment settlement, there's no deduction for sexual harassment subject to non-disclosure agreements paid anymore, so that is a non-deductible expense where entertainment expenses are another thing that went by the wayside. Entertainment expenses are another thing that went by the wayside for people who are take entertainment deductions on their tax return. Those are no longer allowed or modified, so be careful with tickets to a sporting event. Some people will buy tickets to a sporting event and use that as advertisement. That's no longer allowed. So if you buy, you give them to your customers. They can't for tickets. That's no longer allowed. Wake Forest tickets and you give them to your customers. That's no longer an allowed deduction. Exempt organizations did take a hit on how much they're allowed to pay. organizations did take a hit on how much they're allowed to pay to their executives. And that figure is a calculation as well, dependent upon income. And the state of North Carolina is dropping their tax rate just a tad. And the state of North Carolina is dropping their tax rate just a tad. It, it's just, it's just, you really won't see it. And they're, they're, uh, it, it's just a flat rate <laughs> anyway. And they're, they're uh, a flat rate anyway, about 5.5% tax rate. And that's about all I have to share with you right quick. Yes, sir. You mentioned Medical, yes, and thank you for mentioning that. Medical is going to be, um, for 2017, of course, it's a 7.5% deduction against adjusted gross income. So if I have $100,000 worth of income, I have to exclude 7.5% on medical. That's going to change in 2018 going forward uh, to 10%. And then in 2025, it, it, it may go away completely. Yes, sir. Has the threshold changed for itemization? I'm sorry, uh, ask me that. Has the threshold changed to meet itemization? Yes, it has. It, has, it needs to be uh, greater than $24,000 of all uh, deductions in order to itemize. Anything above that, you should be able to itemize. Correct. Yes, sir. Over 65, do you still get an additional deduction, standard deduction? No. Everything is uh, a flat 24 uh, or 12,000. I thought I read that Kippinger. Pardon? I thought I read the Kippinger. No, that did not. Uh, but it's the 24 and the 12. Anybody else have a question? Yes, sir. Where are Captain Daniels back to the zero? Anywhere between zero and seventy-seven thousand dollars for long-term capital gains. Long-term. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And of course, that you, you've got to take into consideration all capital gains. Thank you. Andy. Oh, you're welcome. I'll be around in cabinet. That's all. Right.
would like to speak to Ben or Amy. Doug, John, and Todd are still here. They're going to be in the back for a few minutes. Um, for those of you that are guests of clients, and I know we have several in the audience, if you would like to take a packet of information about our practice, we do have a few of those back there. We've got Amy's cards, Ben's cards. If any of you are interested in speaking to um, John or Todd uh, about uh, your investment situation, you would contact Doug and he would arrange that uh, conversation um, so Doug can talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, put January, not January, J uh, June 10th on your calendar. Uh, that is when we've scheduled this year's summer family picnic. You know, we've been doing that the last couple of years at Tangwood Park. It's an event that we do for all, all of our clients, and you're welcome to bring children and grandchildren. This year we're going to have a carnival theme, and we've got some carnival games and a lot of fun things going on. We'll have barbecue and all that. You'll get emails and newsletters, but I just want to give you a sneak peek that we've already set the date for June 10th. Um, I'll send that email out tomorrow if any of you would consider um, posting a Better Business Bureau review. And I just want to thank you again for coming out this evening, and thank you to all of our panel.